Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Neville Sway. For those that I don't know, I uh, run the Access Program, and we are running this series called uh, Conversations on Climate Change, which is part of the Department of Science and Innovation's um, Initiative for a Functional Climate Change Research Network, which Access is part of itself. Uh, Access is the program that I direct. And um, today you're going to hear from our guests, uh, Ashley Naidu um, from um, Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environmental Chair. I'm going to hand over to him in a moment. But just to say that this series um, is a series which covers a whole variety of different topics. We've done stuff on biodiversity, on fire, on the cryosphere, on health, on law. We're doing today ocean acidification and we'll be doing some more in the future on other topics related to climate change. So welcome everybody. Thanks to Ashley and to our guests. And I'm going to hand to Ashley now to take the floor. Thanks very much. Thanks, Neville. And um, um, I should start by saying good morning and afternoon or evening to all of you. And thanks for joining us. Uh, what is afternoon here in Cape Town in South Africa? Uh, thanks to Naval and Access for continuing to set up this conversation space, uh, which is the sixth one, as he, as he mentioned. Uh, today's topic is ocean acidification. And Neval has lined up an impressive list of speakers for us this afternoon. On the number of attendees, and thank you to all of you for joining again, over 200 people have registered. So that number of participants should steadily tick up at least for the first 20 or 30 minutes of this afternoon. This is quite impressive and then does place something of a burden on Neville to continue these series because there is obvious interest in it. Um, thank you to our speakers, Drs. Um, Richard Freely, Sam Dupont, Anne Cohen and Warren Jova for agreeing to make presentations and share their experience and insights. Uh, the speakers have a bit of a task. With so many people registering, they have to balance their very high levels of personal expertise with the interests of a wide audience. And um, we're holding up, we're holding high expectations for them to meeting all of our 200 needs in their 20 minutes that are allocated to them. I invite those of you attending to add your discussion threads to the chat. Neville and I will be looking at them. And after each presentation, uh, Neville will, may raise one or two points of clarification. But what we'll ask for the bulk of the comments and discussion to come at the end of the four speakers, just in case some of the other speakers touch on what you're interested in. So we'll have some discussion time at the end. Then from my own perspective as working for Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, our new name from the 1st of April uh, this year, uh, ocean acidification is one of those things that we cannot ignore even as South Africa on one end of the African continent. From a governance view, change in distribution and impact areas become important for us. And then from a South African perspective, does the dynamics of our marine ecosystems make us more or less vulnerable? And I think some of the speakers will be touching on that this afternoon. Then internationally, South Africa is branded as we're part of the mega biodiverse countries. So ocean acidification and impacts on biodiversity is obviously important for us from a governance point of view. And then what are realistic responses to this? For a country like South Africa, relatively small, again, one end of the African continent, I'm not saying top or bottom, it's just the one end. Uh, what should we realistically expecting to achieve in terms of the international forums? We do participate in the UNFCCC, and it occurs every year. It takes a lot of resources to participate in it, but realistically, what should we be aiming for in this? And then, uh, we should also look at there are some aspects on the basic sciences occurring in ocean notification in the country and in the region. How do we put all of that or tie it up together so that we become more impactful? I think the expertise that we have across the four speakers will allow some aspects of these to be engaged as well as some of your own um, perspectives from the attendees. So with those that brief introduction, I think I'm turning to our, rich, our first speaker, um, Prof Freely. And by way of introduction, uh, Prof is a NOAA senior fellow um, and also holds um, uh, at the uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in Seattle. 
and holds an affiliate full professorship at the faculty position at the University of Washington School of Oceanography. His major research areas are carbon cycling in oceans and ocean acidification processes. And after his BA in chemistry, he went on to Texas A&M, where he did both his MS and PhD degrees in 1974, receiving his PhD. Both his postgraduate degrees were in chemical oceanography. He is a member of the Clive CO2 Repeat Hydrography Program Oversight Committee and past member of the Senior Committee on U.S. Carbon and Biochemistry Program and presently a member of the U.S. Interagency Working Group on Ocean Acidification. He is a former member of the International Imber Solas Ocean Acidification Group and a member of the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Chemical Society. He has authored more than 300 refereed scientific publications and received the Department of Commerce Gold Award in 2006 for research in ocean acidification. In 2007 was elected to the American Geophysical Union and in 2010 awarded the Heinz Environmental Award for pioneering research in ocean acidification. Uh, those are among several other awards that Prof has received, including the NOAA Administrative Award for his work on 2013 IPCC AR5 Climate Change Report. And in 2017, he was elected to the AAAS Fellow. So I think there's no one more qualified globally to start off a discussion on ocean acidification or the perspective as spanning a few decades. Uh, thank you, Prof. And over to you. Thanks. Richard, you're, you're still muted, huh? Yep. OK, I got gotcha. you. Can you uh, hear me now? Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. It's a pleasure to be here today and discuss certainly my favorite topic, ocean acidification. What I want to talk about is just to provide a broad overview of the chemical changes that have occurred and will occur over time throughout the century. And then I want to show by example uh, some of the research that we have done on the U.S. West Coast because it's an upwelling region and very similar to the uh, uh, eastern boundary currents uh, off of South Africa as well in the Benguela current. So the similarities will be very, very familiar to you. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yep, sorry. Got it? Yeah, this is it. Thank you. So over the past two centuries, mankind has released two trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And CO2 reacts with seawater to form an acid. That reaction is CO2 plus water to form bicarbonate, uh, a carbonic acid, and, and that uh, further dissociates into a hydrogen ion, which causes acid, and a bicarbonate ion. And, and because of that, the oceans have been taking up about 30% uh, of the CO2 that's released into the atmosphere. And because of that uptake uh, through air sea exchange, we are slowly acidifying the oceans. Next slide, please. So this is a slide of the atmospheric increase. This is based on our sister laboratory, the Earth Systems Laboratory in Boulder. And they, this is a worldwide observation. So what you're looking at is the general increase from the south, south pole on the left to the north pole on the right. And this is the zonal average CO2 in a year-to-year -year basis. And it's based on this data like this that we can see from the observations alone the gradual increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Very, very significant. <clears throat> and the total rise throughout the entire world. But you can also see the, the uptake of carbon dioxide into land plants during the summer, and it's released due to respiration in the winter. And it's from observations like this, we know that it's mankind's release of CO2 in the atmosphere that are causing these changes. Next slide, please.
That rate of increase is on the order of one and a half parts per million CO2 per year. Now, similarly, along with this increase in the atmosphere, many scientists uh, have been observing the changing CO2 concentrations in the surface ocean. This, this plot shows three examples of that from the uh, Central Pacific uh, off of Hawaii time series and also two time series in the, in the Atlantic. Of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is shown in black on top, the PCO2, corresponding P, uh, PCO2 at these time series stations in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and the corresponding pH uh, decrease that we see uh, from these data sets uh, in the second panel. And from these observations, we know that the decrease in pH due to the uptake of the anthrogenic CO2 is on the order of about 0.02 pH units decrease per decade. Next slide, please. So uh, CO2 chemistry is very simple. CO2 reacts with water to form carbonic acid that dissociates quickly to form a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. That bicarbonate ion reacts with, with carbonate ion to form more bicarbonate. So you see a hydrogen reacting with carbonate. And in doing so, it decreases the carbonate ion concentration and increases the bicarbonate. Next slide. So the overall reaction is CO2 plus the carbonate ion to form two bicarbonates. And so over time, what we see is that the pH has dropped on, the, on a global basis from about 8.2 to 8.1. This is a 30% increase in the hydrogen ion concentration of seawater. And also we've seen a decrease in the carbonate ion concentration of about 16% from the pre-industrial to now. By the end of this century, next, next, using the IPCC scenarios, we expect to see the pH to drop another 0.3 or 0.4 pH units. And that would be an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration anywhere from 100 to 150%. While the carbonate ion concentration will continue to decrease by as much as 50%. These are major, major scale changes that are occurring in our oceans right now and will continue to occur throughout the entire century. And they are, they're the major cause of ocean acidification. Next slide. And it's not just the fact that we're increasing the CO2 levels, but also the rate of increase is alarming as well. This slide shows the projected rate of increase of CO2 in the atmosphere and the surface ocean over the next 100 years. And you can see that the rate of change is anywhere up to 100 times faster than anything that we have seen uh, over the recent past. And the same thing is true with the global rate of change of temperature, which is shown on the right. Again, what we see is large scale changes that are occurring, which is much faster than that we've ever seen before. And these are, these are important changes because that means the organisms that live in the ocean have to you, you adapt to these changes or evolve in such a way that they can adapt to these changes over a very, very short period of time. For some animals, it's during their lifetime. For other animals, they have to evolve uh, through many generations. Next slide, please. Now, important consideration is that carbonate ion concentration. For animals that produce a calcium carbonate shell, and this is many of the marine resources we like to eat for food, they form a calcium carbonate shell or a skeleton. 
And from the, from the reaction is very simple. The calcium concentration combines with the carbonate ion to form the calcium carbonate shell. And what we say in, in from the perspective of the chemistry, their ability to form the shell is dependent on what we call the saturation state. If the saturation state is greater than one, they can produce their shell and skeleton no problem. If it's near one or at equilibrium, then they will have a difficulty forming that shell. And if it's below one, then it will, shell will begin to dissolve. And in some cases, we see that dissolution occurring while the animal is still alive. Now that saturation state is calculated by the calcium concentration times that carbonate ion concentration divided by the parent solubility product. And as the carbonate ion concentration goes down, the saturation state goes down and it can go below one in the oceans. The apparent solubility product is a function of temperature and pressure. So as the temperature decreases, then you have a change in that solubility constant, and thus also affecting the saturation state so that in cold water or in deep water, the saturation state goes down. So as you go from warm water to cold waters, the saturation state can go down and it can get below one, as we see in some of the upwelling regions. Next slide. Just click through all of them, please. So what we have done is we have surveyed the global oceans and determined the pH state in, at the present in, in 2000. We've calculated the impact of the anthropogenic input and subtracted that out. And so we've been able to determine what the pre-industrial pH in 1770 looked like compared to the present day. And in doing so, then we can see the changes in pH that have taken place, which is shown in the right-hand panel. And so what we see that on a global basis, step it one more time, please. On a global basis, the change from 1770 to, to 2000 is on average a change in pH of about 0.1 pH units. And as I said, that's an increase in the hydrogen concentration of about 30%. So it's 30% um, higher than it was in 1770. And you can look and see where these differences occur. And you can see, for example, very, very large changes occur in the high northern latitudes where the temperatures are cooler and the high southern latitudes. And you can see from this that the region around South Africa is a region, a hot spot for acidification. Uh, uh, along that particular region, as it is in most of the of the Southern Ocean. Next slide, please. You got it. Yep. Yep. Uh, take step it one more time, please. So from the projections that we have from the IPCC, step it one more time, please. Uh, we can see that the changes that will take place, whoops, I'm sorry, back one. We can see the changes that will take place from the pre-industrial out to the future based on the IPC scenarios. And we can see that in addition to these high northern and southern latitudes, there is an increased intensity of change in the upwelling regions uh, along the uh, coast of North and South America and also along the Bengola current regions in, in, in off of South Africa. And so these are hotspot regions. The combined effects of upwelling of CO2 rich waters and acidification from above 
provide a hotspot for enhanced acidification. And so these are regions where we would expect to see the biological consequences of acidification occurring earlier and, and with more severity. Next slide, please. Now this is a projection based on the IPCC 8.5 CO2 scenarios. And what I'm showing here is the pH starting at about 1850. And the number in the center is the average pH for the global oceans. And the red dots shows the average changes over time. You see it's already developing by 1950 to see significant changes taking place. And out to the present right now, you can see the drop to 8.1 or so. And using the RPC 8.5 scenario, you can see the projection out to the end of the century. So this is a good example of the global change in pH we are expecting to see if mankind doesn't re, uh, slow down its use of fossil fuels. And again, near uh, South Africa, you can see very dramatic changes taking place, one of the most sensitive regions on the planet. Next slide, please. So in these regions up upwelling, and this is showing the, the region of the California current system, you have the anthropogenic CO2 coming from the atmosphere and exchanging across the air sea interface, enriching the CO2 in the surface waters and mixing downwards. At the same time, you have upwelling of waters that are rich in CO2 from respiration upwelling in along the coast, mostly along the bottom, all the way to the beach, and then spreading out from the beach outward. So you have the combined effects of CO2-rich waters from uh, air sea exchange of CO2, as well as from the outwelling. So these are regions where you see the most dramatic change in pH and the reduction of the carbonate ion concentration. Now, in addition to the effects of acidification, you have the effects of, of enhanced productivity due to the upwelling and the enhanced respiration taking place, enhancing the CO2 and the lowering of the pH and carbonate ion concentrations. And all these combined effects will be intensified along the coast of, of North America, South America, and, and Africa in these upwelling zones. Next slide, please. So from time series work that we have along the coast of, of the North American coast, we can see very clear increases in the CO2 concentration over time. This is the work that's been done by Francisco Chavez at Embari at the, their long time series station. And on the top panel is the pCO2 and on the bottom panel is the pH. And the blue colors are the observations at the Embari site. And overlaid on that is the observations at the hot time series in, in orange. And you can see that the change in pH in these upwelling zones are actually faster, and the decrease is faster than you would have see in the open ocean. And this is an example of that combined effect of acidification in hump and upwelling, combining to show a more rapid change in the acidification. And this is what we are seeing along our coast. And you would expect to see that in other upwelling regimes as well. Next slide, please. This is an example of the changes that are taking place from 2017 to 2020. Uh, 
six, 2016 along our west coast on the left hand side is off of Mexico and on the right hand side is off of Canada. And what you can see is that buildup of anthropogenic CO2 in the water column and the decreasing uh, aragonite uh, saturation state on the right hand side. Now these changes are taking place and from monitoring our data throughout the water column, we can see the changes that are occurring. And what happens is you see the most intense changes in uh, uptake of anthropogenic CO2 in surface waters are in the south relative to the nose, but the deepening of that anthropogenic CO2 is most intensified in the north because of enhanced mixing of the water downward in the north. Next slide, please. So these are the many species and impacts that uh, scientists have been able to observe for marine species. Sam and, and Anne will talk about this in detail. Overall, we see reduced calcification rate for the calcifiers, increased dissolution of their shells, changes to behavioral response, to fitness, changes to um, species diversity and changes in food webs and many changes to the ecosystems which affect the fisheries along our coast. The, the shellfish industry on the west coast is the largest industry, the crab industry and the abalone industry is the largest industry on our west coast. So it's a very serious situation for our communities. I'm just gonna step real quickly through some of the processes because I know I'm getting out of time. So step through the next few slides fairly fast, just to show you some of the examples of the impacts that we're seeing thus far. So we see significant impacts on oysters and oyster larvae. We see tremendous impacts on pteropods. Pteropods are particularly important because they provide the food for salmon and other species. And these are the changes in, in the dissolution of the pteropods, both at present and in the future. Just keep stepping through the slides. And so we're seeing changes uh, in real time, and we're seeing 50% of the pteropods are already beginning to dissolve their shells. Next slide. And the projection is by 2050, the impact on the pteropods would have 70% of dissolution. Pteropod dissolution is occurring uh, most intensely onshore and in nearshore regions as shown here compared to offshore. The dissolution is most intense in the center because of the impact of dissolution in that region of the shell, which is the oldest part of the shell. We also see dissolution occurring in Dungeness crab. Dungeness crab is the largest fishery on the US West Coast and there's evidence for dissolution of the, sh of the sh crab larvae. Next slide. Not only do we see changes in the dissolution, but we see impacts on the mechanoreceptors, mechano the, the feelers that the animal has uh, drop out and are lost because of dissolution, because the central channel around the feelers, the setae, are, are no longer able to hold them in place. So they lose their ability to uh, sense their environment. Next slide, please. And other studies in the laboratory have shown that the ability of salmon and another keystone species on our west coast to avoid being eaten by, by their predators is greatly reduced in high CO2 levels. That is, they, they lose their ability to sense uh, their predators and, and uh, go away and, and be, go away from being eaten. So this final slide then I wanted to show is the potential impacts of acidification uh, on different species if we allow 
CO2 levels to rise out to the 8.5 scenario by the end of this century. These are the harmful impacts that are, are, are envisioned. And if we reduce our CO2 emissions to maximum level possible, we can see we can avoid most of these severe impacts. So Mantine has a choice to make on a, and the release of fossil fuel CO2 in the atmosphere and the biological implications for these decisions are quite important to mankind. You know, the fisheries resources for humankind is uh, suggested the effect of acidification may be up to about $500 billion per year in terms of total impacts on, our, on an annual basis by the end of the century. So our major challenge is to determine the anthrogenic CO2 and the biological consequences. And Sam and Ann will talk about that. The rates of acidification will increase with increasing emissions and the biological effects are occurring now and will be more severe in the future. And we can slow down CO2 by developing good mitigation and adaptation strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, I've been looking at the chat and there's not too many, um, uh, or there aren't any significant points on clarification. And because we've allocated you a few more minutes to get through those uh, important slides at the end, we're going to jump right to the next speaker and we'll come back for questions at the end. So thanks, Richard. Um, our next speaker is Prof. Sam DuPont. Sam is Associate Professor and Senior Lecturer at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. His main research topic is on the effect of global changes on marine ecosystems, and he's been working on biological impacts of ocean acidification for a decade and a half. He's a member of the Advisory Board on Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center and the Executive Council of the Global Ocean Acidification Observation Network. He's also the focal point of the Large Scale Ocean Acidification Capacity Building Program, organizing trainings and activities in many countries, including Africa. Thank you, Sam. Are you still on mute? We can't hear you if you start talking. I'm yes. still muted, Sam. Uh, oh, there we go. Good. So sorry about that. So thank you for the nice words and the opportunity to give this little presentation to all of you. It's inspiring to see so many people attending. So it was it's a great the continuation of the talk done by, 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 by Dick because uh, he really well introduced really well the chemistry and now I'm going to jump into the, the biological impact and, and discuss a bit more what, what can be done. So we'll start with a really brief overview of, of the biological impact and then really focus the second part of the talk on what we can do to address, address this. But let's start with the biology. So we, we know now from, from the previous presentation that the global ocean chemistry is changing. So the next question is, it's so what? And, and Richard already kind of, of, of give you a hint that, of course, we expect a lot of negative consequences. If you really want to understand something like, like ocean acidification or any kind of global change for that matter, you have different ways of doing that. So you can do experiment in the lab, do observation and experiment in the field, but you can also go back in time and see when something similar happened in the past. So not exactly the same thing, of course, but something similar. And and one period in the, in the history of the planet where we had something like that was the end of the Permian, where we had massive changes in carbonate chemistry of the ocean together with global warming and so on. And what happened is that we had a massive extinction. So it was the third extinction where 92% of all marine species went extinct. So I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that's a good indication that we should worry about these issues. But then, as I said, you have other approaches and you can just do experiment. And, and if you try to summarize a little bit what has been done in terms of the impact of, of acidification, we can say that if you compile the whole literature, about 50 percent, for example, of all the marine animals that have been tested are have been shown to have a negative response. So they are threatened by ocean acidification. So that's also a very good reason to be worried and even more. Actually, we have already today evidence that that it's happening. So Richard has been instrumental in this story, showing that 
because of, of this change in upwelling that he, he just explained, you had actually impact on aquaculture of oysters on the west coast of the US with consequences for jobs and of course, and of course for the biology. So, so we have overwhelming evidence today that ocean acidification will have negative impact on things we care about, marine species, ecosystem, including things that provides excellent services to us all. And that's why acidification has been identified as one of the major issue. And if you check, for example, the Sustainable Development Goal, which is really great framework to address most of the big issues that we have on the planet. And if you zoom on the SDG 14, which is about uh, sea and, and water, you actually have one of these targets that is dedicated to ocean acidification. And the target is really well phrased. Basically, the goal of addressing these SDGs is to minimize and address the impacts of ocean acidification. So basically, solving the problem. But the next question, of, the next question is, how do we do this? Of course, and, and that's really where the challenge is. How do we minimize and address the impacts? And if we want to do that efficiently, we want to be effective in doing the right thing, and we want to be efficient in doing things right. And, and I'm going to split the, the next part of the, 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 the presentation along these two lines. First, we want to do the right thing. So what science do we need if we really want to address ocean acidification? And that's really at the core of one of the new framework. I don't know if you're aware about that, but we just started the UN Decade for the Ocean Science. And really the motto of the decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. So what kind of science do we need if we really want to address ocean acidification? And more importantly, how fast can we go? Because uh, as Greta Thunberg, the Swedish activist said, the house is on fire. We don't have time to play games. We don't have time to, to you know, collect use, useless information. We need to prioritize what we do if we want to address the issue. But what can we do really? I think I always use this example where the little mouse is basically us. We are in front of a massive change in the environment, climate change, ocean acidification, and so on. That act, uh, that's the cat. And if we don't address the issue, we're going to end up being, being dead. That's as simple as that. So we need to find a way to kill the cat. And, and basically, when you're facing such a challenge, you have three options. You wait and see, which seems to be a terrible idea. You kill the cat, which is really what we should do, but sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming, like this poor little mouse would have a hard time killing the cat alone, or you escape. And basically, when it comes to acidification and other global change, this is the same options we have. We wait and see, terrible idea. We kill the cat, which is called mitigation, and that's what, what Richard was talking about. We decrease carbon dioxide emission. Or you can escape, which would be adaptation. So you basically, you don't solve the problem, you try to avoid the negative consequences. And if we really want to address these issues, we have to do both. Because mitigation is really the solution, no doubt about that. We need to change the way we do things to reduce carbon dioxide emission. But we also know that it's going to take time. That will require big changes in policy, that requires individual changes. That's going to take time. Uh, so basically that requires so much changes that what can we, we have to think about what kind of science can really help to make that happen. And as I said, we, we know already a lot. We know that if we don't cut carbon dioxide emissions, we are in trouble. I was really inspired by, by this guy, Ken Caldera, who is working in Stanford. And he said, people have to sacrifice a little bit of their short-term self-interest to help the world be a better place on the long term. And really how we, we get people to do that is the most important research that can be done. And that's how we, we went with the idea, like actually most of the science we do is not very convincing for people in the street. Like if you go in front of the marine station where I work and say to people, if we don't cut carbon dioxide emission, the respiration rate of sea urchin will decrease, or even talking about theropods, I don't think they will care so much because it's too far from emotionally from what they care about. So we decided let's do science on what people care about. So we went on the field, asked people, what do you care about? And in, here in Sweden, what they like is basically seafood is on the top of the list. So we decided let's do an experiment on seafood and see if we can see an effect of ocean acidification. And the answer is yes, of course, like in most organisms, but then we decided if you want to speak to these people, we have to show that we have an impact on something they care about. And that's when we did, 
well, that's why we decided to study the impact of acidification on taste. And we could show that if you expose the local shrimp that is really popular in Sweden to ocean acidification, they taste different and people don't like them as much. So that was a fantastic communication opportunity. And what we could see is that if we were using this communication approach where we talk about something that people care about, make them physically experience an invisible threat that is ocean acidification, they care more and they're actually more willing to take a change. And, and we could follow people several months after having this experience and we could see that they were actually changing things in their life. We suggested eat less meat or travel smarter and they were doing it. So that's what that's the kind of science we need. We know more than enough to say acidification is bad, but maybe what we need is science that drives emotion, science that actually make people care about these issues so they are more willing to change their, their way. But anyway, we, we know mitigation will take time. Uh, and that means that we have to buy some time. And to buy some time, you can do something else, which is called adaptation. So adaptation is basically changing the way we do certain things to, to limit the negative impact of, in this case, ocean acidification. And, and that's a different scale, because when you talk about mitigation, that's a global issue. It needs to be resolved globally. But adaptation, it needs to be resolved locally. And for that, you need local data. On this picture, you can see oyster farmer in, in, in Hong Kong. These guys, they don't really care what's happening at the global scale. All they want to do is be able to culture their oysters and ensure that they were going to have a livelihood in the future. And in most places, this is really the issue we need to address, how we can help communities locally to still benefit from the ocean and in a more sustainable way. One of the problems when you talk to policymakers, really, and, and, and discuss about these issues is that we still have an old way of thinking that doesn't work for ocean acidification. So when you have a new threat coming into the ocean, like a pollutant, for example, the, the traditional approach is that you monitor it, you identify the source, you decide, okay, this is the threshold, this is the limit of how much we want into the environment, and then you implement, you implement solutions. So, for example, you regulate the amount of, of that substance that can enter into the ocean. It doesn't work for ocean acidification because pH and carbon dioxide are natural. So that's part of the natural life. So organisms out there, ecosystem, they experience pH and carbon dioxide all the time. And the, and the thing is that the level they experience here in Sweden is completely different than the level they would experience in South Africa or in China. So organisms will be adapted to different things, meaning that there won't be a single threshold, a single limit that will apply for the whole world. Some organisms will perform better than others. And a good way of illustrating this is like an experiment that some colleagues of mine made in Chile. So in Chile, what they did is they studied a species of copepods. So copepods are very important. It's a key part of the food chain. So if we don't have copepods, we don't have fish, for example. So copepods are really important. And what they did is they decided, okay, we're going to test the impact of acidification on one key species of copepod, but they collected them in two different parts of Chile. And what they saw is that copepods from the population one were showing really strong negative effect uh, from ocean acidification, where the population two actually were benefiting from the same stress or what they thought was stress. The same negative impact, the same exposure to, to, to low pH. So that was really confusing. Why are two populations of the same species responding so differently? And that's also very annoying if you want to, you know, make some modeling about what's going to happen in the future, because what you see in one population can't be applied to another one. So we really needed to explain why it was. And the reason is basically they are experiencing different things today. So the population one actually experience a very constant pH through the whole year. So they are actually adapted to really narrow range of pH. And when you put them a little bit in, in a little bit lower pH, what's happening is that they are really negatively impacted because that's a big stress for them. Where the one coming from the population too, live in a quite fluctuating environment. So you have much more variability there, meaning that the same change in pH doesn't have the same impact on them. Actually, it's not even a stress. And to some extent, it, they actually can benefit from it. So that makes you also realize that if you want to address the issue locally, like in South Africa or even in different parts of South Africa, you really need local data. You need local chemistry, understand how much pH, pCO2 are fluctuating, and also local data for the biology. So there is no shortcut. You have to go there. 
And that's very important to understand is the chemistry and the biology, because if you don't, you can't really develop solutions. And solution could be, for example, change the way you do aquaculture or help uh, local species to actually evolve to be to actually be adapted to these conditions. Because it's possible to, to buy some time. And again, a good example of that is what happened on the west coast of the US. So remember the story where oyster farmers started to have problems to, to produce the little juvenile uh, oysters they had because of ocean acidification. And, and thanks to scientists, they could, act, I think they could actually find a solution. But when you have a problem like that, so one of the options is that, okay, obviously we need to reduce carbon dioxide emission, but that was a wrong time scale because we know it's going to take decades. And in the meantime, this poor oyster farmer, they, would have, they won't have any job left. So in that case, the real viable option was really to, to change practices, find a way to cope with the negative effect of acidification. And one of the key factors that people uh, identified from the science was to realize that actually oysters are not that bad at coping with acidification, except at the very beginning of their larval development. So during that period, when they moved from the trochophore larva to the D-shaped larva, they need to precipitate a lot of calcium carbonate, and that's very costly in terms of energy, and it's happening extremely fast, making them particularly sensitive to acidification. So when people realize that, they realize if we are extremely careful during that period of time, like if we keep the chemistry right at that time, then we can still grow oysters, despite the fact that the conditions are not optimal. So that was a way to adapt to acidification, change the practice of aquaculture company, and, and then by a few decades, in the meantime, hopefully the, the human species will learn to, to produce less carbon dioxide. So for adaptation, again, there is no shortcut. This is really something we need to do in parallel to mitigation, but for that we need local data, because without this data we can't really find solutions and, and implement them. So that's the do the right thing. We need to prioritize science for more efficient mitigation and adaptation. But we also, if we want to do some ocean acidification science, we also need to do the things right. So we need to develop best practices. And to do that, we need to do monitoring right. We need to have good infrastructure to implement best practices, measuring pH, measuring alkalinity, measuring DIC, doing biological experiment. This is not trivial. That requires knowledge, that requires equipment. And, and, and sometimes it can really be a challenge in Africa. And Africa is actually doing great when you check, for example, the progress that have been made for the SDG 14. It's progressing extremely fast in all around the continent. Actually, most countries do better than Sweden, where I work, which is amazing. And I think you should all be really proud of that. But when it comes to the SDG 14.3, uh, so acidification, the thing is that the, 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 the available infrastructure and knowledge is still quite limited in many countries. So there is a strong need. So that's a color code basically showing like red being like very, very challenging in terms of infrastructure and knowledge where dark green is actually great. And, and the map on the left is the average per country where the picture on the right is the worst case scenario. So for example, for South Africa, you have excellent lab doing excellent work already today, but some of the lab have a little bit more of a challenge. So that's also show the importance of, of collaboration and solidarity. But in some places, you can see that there is really a need for capacity building there. And that's why the OAICC, which is the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center, decided to create a capacity building program to, in collaboration with many different partners. And we organize courses, we provide equipment, and we provide also long-term support, financial, but also the technical support to, to, to increase the possibility to do ocean acidification research. And actually, at the moment, I'm doing an evaluation of the situation or re-evaluation of the situation in Africa. So if you are from a lab and you want to actually be part of this capacity building program, please contact me and I will ask you to, uh, to participate to this evaluation so we can know what you need. We can know what you need in terms of training equipment and so on. So please contact me. My email is on the slide here and I will include you in this. And you, because at the end of the day, we really want you to do the best science you can. And that, as I said, require infrastructure. And if you want to answer a complex question, it can require 
complex infrastructure. So an example of an experiment we did in my lab a couple of years ago. But the good news is that even if you have little, there is always something you can do. This is an example of what we achieved in two weeks. So basically, we arrived in Inyaka in Mozambique, where they, all they had was a building. The electricity was connected the day before we arrived. In a week, we could build a basic lab with aquarium system where you could control the, the pH in the water, and we could collect the first data, the first biological data. That was not very expensive. That was not very complicated. But even if you don't have that, you can still do science. We developed within the YMSA program on ocean acidification a simple protocol that I'm more than happy to share with you to study ocean acidification with just a bench, seawater, a bottle of CO2, and a couple of, of glassware and plasticware. So there is always a way to collect interesting data. I will, I'm all is done, but I will just, I would like to highlight a success story from South Africa with, with Carla. So Carla uh, first uh, entered the field in acidification with a basic training in 2016, and since then became a leader in South Africa in both chemistry and biology. So she had an amazingly well thought uh, PhD thesis, that, and she, she actually graduated last week. So congratulations to her. And, uh, and she really combined con monitoring in the field with biological experiments, so kind of the perfect method. So again, if you enter into the field, I strongly recommend to read her thesis. So in conclusion, acidification needs to be addressed. There is no doubt about that. This is a big problem. We have tons of evidence showing that there will be negative consequence, and there is already negative consequence today. If we want to address the issue, we need to mitigate. We need to reduce carbon dioxide emission, and to do that, we need science that is society relevant and communicated in a way that we will make people care more. And if we want to adapt to buy the time we need, we need to co-design it with industry and we need solution-based science. And also capacity building is very important, but even if you have very little, you can start today. So even if your lab is, doesn't have any experience, there are stuff you need to learn, but it's not that complicated. There will be training, there, there will be training next year for sure, so you can start anytime. And I couldn't help myself but to make a reference to Star Wars for my, for my last slide, because today is the 4th of May. So as you might know, it's the Star Wars Day, so may the 4th be with you. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thank you very much for that. I think um, you move very well from um, Richard's presentation of setting the global scene to some very good local examples and local action. So said, yes, the problem is there, the whole cat has to be killed, but but you can start with just this one leg, you know, by, by dealing with the societal problems um, and, and being relevant to society um, in the research we have. So, Anne, if you can start getting your presentation up on, uh, we'll move on to you because I know you have a time, time limit and there are no technical questions or clarification questions. So our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Ann Cohen, uh, who's a scientist and oceanographer, and um, as Neville puts it, self-proclaimed curious person who spent the last 25 years at Woods Hole Oceanic Institute studying and exploring her passions with coral reefs. She's a tenured scientist and faculty uh, in the MIT uh, Woods Hole Oceanic Institute Joint Graduate Program in Oceanography and author of more than 80 papers on climate change and climate impacts on coral reef systems. Dr. Cohen served as expert witness to the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Fisheries Conservation, Wildlife and Oceans, the Science Steering Committee for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on Impacts of Ocean Acidification on Marine Ecosystems, and the Stanford University Center for Ocean Solutions Working Group on Corals and Climate Change. She emanates from Cape Town, where she did a PhD at UCT, and she is named one of Eco Magazine's top 15 coral researchers of 2020 and has won many awards for her prestigious work. So, thank you, Anne. And thanks so much. To make Just it trying to get my presentation up here. Is that working? Yes, we can see. I can see. Yep. All good. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining. And, and Neville and Ashley, thanks so much for, for inviting me to join this very prestigious team of scientists. 
Um, it's great to be back in South Africa, at least virtually for a while. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, some work that we've been doing on coral reef ecosystems and the impact of um, ocean acidification on coral reefs. Uh, this is a scene uh, for in, in Indonesia, the Indonesian Thruway, um, showing some artisanal fishers um, on a beautiful coral reef. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with coral reef ecosystems and just the sheer beauty and magnificence uh, of, these, of these places. Um, you probably are less aware, as I was just a few years ago, how important coral reef ecosystems are for millions and millions of people around the world. In fact, an estimated 1 billion people uh, rely on coral reef ecosystems for their livelihoods. This map shows um, uh, the coral reef ecosystem uh, neediness index, uh, the, the pink, the shade of pink, the darker the shade of pink you see, uh, the more dependent people are on coral reef ecosystems uh, for basic food, livelihoods, uh, income from tourism, etc. And you see on the east coast uh, of, of southern Africa, um, including South Africa, 125 kilometers of reef along the coast of, southern, of South Africa, uh, the dependence on coral reefs is very high. In addition to our own dependence on coral reefs, um, an estimated 25% or quarter of all marine species uh, find their homes on coral reef ecosystems. And overall, uh, coral reefs are estimated to be worth uh, $375 billion to the global economy. Now, all this is made possible by the creature, the coral animal, uh, called a coral polyp. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiny organism. Uh, most are about one millimeter in diameter. They look very much like sea anemones with a ring of tentacles surrounding um, a mouth. Uh, most live colonially. Uh, they're actually related to sea anemones and jellyfish uh, with some very important differences. Uh, one of these is that uh, most coral reefs, in fact, all the corals that build reef systems today, um, harbor algal symbionts in their, inside their cells. So this is a coral polyp here. Can you see my pointer? Um, and inside the cells are uh, little uh, dinoflagellates, tiny little algae. And these algae are actually using uh, carbon dioxide to produce a photosynthate, um, a glucose-rich product that's actually transferred to the coral animal um, and provides about up to 90% of the energy that it requires for food. So corals are actually dependent on the carbon dioxide in the seawater uh, to produce the food that they need to live. Corals also differ from sea anemones and jellyfish in that they make calcium carbonate skeletons. And it's these calcium carbonate skeletons that obviously uh, build the coral reef. Uh, they combine calcium ions and carbonate ions uh, in the seawater to make calcium carbonate molecules and then stack these molecules together to make calcium carbonate crystals. And this scanning electron microscope image that I'm showing you here um, is a representation of the kinds of crystals that corals make. And all corals all over uh, uh, reefs all across the world um, all different shapes and different sizes and different species and genera, they're all pretty much doing the same thing, producing these calcium carbonate crystals from the carbon and the carbonate ions in seawater uh, to, to build magnificent skeletons. And millions of skeletons over thousands of years accumulate together to build the coral reef and also the coral reef islands uh, that are the home to millions of people across the world.
Now, as global uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, have increased, and this plot just shows the uh, emissions trajectory since 1990, um, and you can see that you know by 2020 we're at 38 gigatons of CO2 emitted per year, with a slight drop here during the global pandemic, but really just a blip uh, in the overall picture. As CO2 emissions have increased, you might imagine that now there's more carbon dioxide uh, in the water, as, as uh, Professor Feely and Sam were um, explaining earlier. There's more carbon dioxide in the water, so this would, should be good for corals because corals need carbon dioxide uh, for, photos, for photosynthesis. The algal symbionts need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. And they also need carbonate ions uh, for to make skeletons. But in fact, as the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere is increasing, the carbonate chemistry of the ocean is, is, is changing in a way that is not beneficial to corals. So as the CO2 uh, concentration increases in the atmosphere, the uh, concentration of aqueous carbon dioxide in the, in the seawater increases, but the pH declines. And if you're a calcifying organism, and this is corals and coral reefs, the carbonate ion concentration is declining as well. So very early on uh, in my career in ocean acidification, uh, we were interested to, to ask the question, okay, so the carbonate ion concentration uh, is declining in the, in the, in the uh, seawater. Um, what impact, if any, would ha this have on coral reefs and, and, and the organisms that build the reefs, uh, the corals? So my colleagues and I set up some experiments at the Bermuda Institute for Ocean Sciences. Uh, in the slide, in, in the first picture here, what you're seeing are mother corals. We pulled them off the reef and brought them to the uh, outdoor aquaria, where we wait for the full moon. And at the full moon, these mother corals, which are pregnant with babies, open their mouths and release the babies into the water. And you can see here, this is a close-up of one of the mother corals, and these little white dots that are coming out are actually the coral larvae that we call coral planula. This is a close-up picture of the coral mouth opening at the full moon and releasing this planula larva. And after about 24 hours, uh, we collect a ton of, of baby corals and they actually look like uh, little worms at this point. Um, they, they're about one millimeter long. They ha uh, have their little algal symbionts that they got from their mothers. And another important thing that they get from their mothers is a lot of fat. So these um, babies are about 75% uh, lipid. And they're gonna need that because they go through a whole metamorphosis process before they turn into real corals. So in the lab, uh, we offer the coral planulae or the little larvae uh, ceramic tile to settle on. And after about three days, uh, the larva finds a place to live, uh, settles on the substrate and metamorphoses into what we call a primary polyp. So this is the, the, the first stage of becoming a real coral. And it's really the first stage also of building a coral reef. And this is the primary polyp. It is metamorphosed from the planula. You can see its little tentacles uh, forming, the central mouth. And when we remove the coral animal, uh, what is left behind is this beautiful uh, skeleton called the primary skeleton that the coral has been able to build after only three days of being alive, which is to me is just totally remarkable. So what we did in our, to address the question, how would corals and specifically their larvae, which are a very sensitive stage uh, in, the, in the coral life cycle, respond to changes in 
the carbonate chemistry of the ocean, specifically the decline in carbon ion concentration um, that we know is happening and will continue to happen as ocean acidification progresses through the 21st century. So we mimic these the uh, ocean acidification process in the lab. And what you're seeing here are baby coral skeletons uh, grown under ambient um, conditions. That's about 240 micromole per kilogram of carbonate ion concentration per, per kilogram of seawater. Uh, then we increase the uh, CO2 in the water, decreasing the carbonate ion concentration to about 170 micromoles of carbonate ion per kilogram of seawater. And here, uh, the seawater is acidified even more to less than 100 micromoles of common ion per kilogram of seawater. And what you can see um, as we increase the acidity of the seawater from left to right, and as we decrease the common ion concentration in the seawater in the experimental aquarium in the lab, what we see is that these baby corals have a much harder time producing skeleton. And this is, this is intuitive. I mean, corals require carbonate ions to build skeletons because they build them from calcium carbonate. So if you reduce the amount of carbonate available in the seawater, it seems kind of obvious that these corals are going to have a harder time producing skeletons. So then we asked ourselves, okay, so we see these effects in the laboratory. Let's go out into the real world and see if we can find evidence for ocean acidification impacts on coral reefs in nature. Now, one of the, our field sites um, the, in Palau, which is in the far Western Pacific, about a, a two hour flight south of Japan. Um, we had been working in this area for quite a while, and we know that these rock islands within the Palau archipelago are naturally acidic, or naturally more acidic. Here is a plot showing carbon ion concentration on the y-axis at the different sites that we sampled in Palau. And what you see is as we move into these rock island areas, the carbon ion concentration decreases significantly. In fact, within these rock island semi-isolated spots, the carbon ion concentration of the seawater is today what we project the tropical Pacific Ocean to be 100 years from now. So we're really seeing a natural case of ocean acidification happening today in these reefs due to natural processes. And we thought, okay, this is a great uh, natural laboratory for us to examine how ocean acidification might impact coral reefs in the future. But when we studied the coral reefs in the rock islands of Palau, what we actually found were very diverse, healthy coral reef communities thriving under conditions of ocean acidification that we expect across the global tropics 100 years from now. Uh, these corals were growing, the reefs are diverse, um, they, were, they were seemingly healthy, uh, the coral cover was high, 63%. Uh, in some of these areas, and the coral diversity also high. Uh, this is not what we expected um, based on our experiences in the laboratory where we were mim mim mimicking ocean acidification conditions. And this was not just a puzzle for us. In fact, many uh, coral reef scientists um, had noted similarly that while we were seeing these obvious effects of ocean acidification in our experiments in the laboratory, 
it was proving very difficult to attribute changes in the wild to ocean acidification. But when we look closely at these um, coral reef communities in, in the Pilar Rock Islands that were living under natural conditions of ocean acidification, what we realized was that the corals were pockmarked with um, heavy evidence of bioerosion. So this is a coral, this is a Parides coral. It's very common across the Indo-Pacific. You find it on the South African reefs as well. And what you're seeing here are holes bored into the skeleton of the coral um, by boring organisms. So my graduate student, Tom DiCarlo, for, his, P for uh, his PhD thesis, decided to investigate the potential relationship between bioerosion and ocean acidification. And to do this, we um, sampled 19 coral reef ecosystems across the Pacific Basin using a handheld drill. We extracted cores from these corals and then we shipped them back to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where we sent them through a, a 3D CAT scanner. And what CAT scanner reveals is the extent of bi erosion, which are these big holes here that you can see in the coral core that is revealed in the CAT scan. Now in this plot, what you're seeing is bi erosion versus aragonite saturation state. And aragonite saturation state is essentially uh, the carbonate ion concentration. So the carbonate ion concentration in this plot is decreasing from right to left. And what Tom found was that in low nutrient reefs, uh, we see a, an increase, statistically significant increase in the amount of bioerosion in corals as the carbon ion concentration decreases. And that this effect is exacerbated significantly on reefs uh, where there's either, either natural high nutrient levels or the nutrient levels are high due to uh, pollution or runoff from land. And we think that uh, one of the reasons the nutrients is making such a big difference is because the bioroders thrive on the nutrients in the seawater. Nevertheless, we're seeing increased bioerosion erosion of corals with decreasing by, uh, carbon ion concentration or increasing ocean acidification wherever we go. Now to make the connection between ocean acidification and bioerosion. erosion was a tough one. There are a number of different um, explanations. One is that bioerosion actually use um, an acid to dissolve the skeleton as they're eroding into the coral. Another potential explanation is that the corals under ocean acidification are growing. They look healthy. They're doing their thing. They're making babies but the skeletons are thin. And when the skeletons are thin, because there's not enough carbon and iron to build a thick skeleton, the bioroders have a much easier time eroding into the skeleton. So we decided to test this hypothesis, and this was part of the thesis of my graduate student, Nathaniel Monica. Uh, and in this study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2017, what we showed is a strong correlation between the density of coral skeleton and the carbonate ion concentration or the, or the levels of ocean acidification in a way that when the carbonate ion concentrations are low, corals don't make dense skeleton. So their ability to produce calcium carbonate is reduced. And so they're not putting extra calcium carbonate into making dense skeletons. They're growing, but those skeletons are thin. 
So we realized that probably one of the reasons that we were having such a hard time detecting impacts of ocean acidification in the wild, on wild reefs, we were seeing it so clearly in the laboratory, is because the impacts are somewhat hidden. It's not like uh, coral bleaching caused by, caused by ocean warming, where you can see the corals all turning white, and then many of them die over in a matter of weeks. This is not that kind of impact. This is a more subtle, invisible impact of climate change on coral reef ecosystems. But it's potentially really, really important because especially for coral reefs, barrier reefs um, that are exposed to tremendous force from waves and storms and tsunamis, those corals have to make really dense skeletons in order to survive those conditions. Clearly, ocean acidification will decrease the ability of corals to strengthen their skeletons and thus defend the rest of the, the, rest of the reef ecosystem from the impacts of waves and storms. When we discovered this connection between coral skeletal density or the thickness of the skeleton and ocean acidification, we asked ourselves, okay, maybe we've been looking in the wrong places. Let's take some of our really, really long, long coral samples that we have, um, that we've collected from the, around the world, and examine um, the changes in density of the skeleton over time because it's probably in that density that we will see, if any, the impacts of ocean acidification. This is a core, um, it's about, this, this coral is, is about 400 years old, and we collected this in uh, the Central Red Sea. And this is one of the corals that we used in an examination of impacts of ocean acidification on coral reefs, on uh, several coral reefs across the Pacific. This is a paper that we just published last year. It is showing the first uh, evidence for the impact of human-induced ocean acidification on coral growth in the wild. This is my colleague at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Weifu Guo. He led this research uh, that was published in Geophysical Research Letters. What we're showing here on this plot on the right is time since 1870. On the y-axis is coral density. And on the 2y-axis is seawater pH. The blue line is the average ocean pH. And you can see how it's been declining steadily since 1870, as Dick showed in his presentation. The black line here is the density of the skeleton of corals on the Great Barrier Reef. So we looked at about um, 300, 375 coral cores from the Great Barrier Reef. This is the average density. And what you see is since about 1970, this precipitous drop in the density of coral skeletons on the Great Barrier Reef. Now we're also seeing uh, precipitous drops in skeletal density in corals in the South China Sea, but we don't yet see evidence for these changes in corals in the Central Pacific Ocean, in some of the uh, marine protected areas in the Central Pacific. And we think that the reason, one hypothesis for why we're seeing these precipitous declines in coral density, skeletal density in some areas and not others, is because in some areas, 
the ocean is the rate of progression of ocean acidification, as you can see here in the pink and the red lines, is much faster than it is in the open ocean because of additional imp impacts of uh, human impacts or human activities that uh, transport um, organic matter from land into the onto the reef or pollution that's that's uh, a sewage that's left there from from boat dive boats ships um, all coming off land as well and this causes a an acceleration of the rate of acidification on the reef that's much faster than what we see in the open ocean this really was the first it took us a while to get there because the impacts of ocean acidification on coral reefs well, in theory and in the lab are really obvious. They're not so obvious in the wild. It's taken us some time. And as you see, putting together pieces of the puzzle to get to where we are today. So we're only just starting to unveil what's been happening on coral reefs due to ocean acidification. The next step is a global campaign to really characterize these effects that we're seeing in the Great Barrier Reef and in the South China Sea across the global oceans, to see where and, and what to what magnitude uh, these effects are happening. At this point, we don't actually have a strategy for mitigation or adaptation. It's not clear to us that corals, just because of the way acidification impacts coral skeletons, it's not clear to us <clears throat> yet whether corals can adapt or mitigate these impacts in the wild. What we might find as we collect more data is that um, mitigation of direct human activities that accelerate rates of pH decline and ocean acidification on reefs if we can mitigate those, if we can control those, if we can manage those, we can considerably lessen the rate at which coral decline due, due to ocean acidification can occur. I'm going to wrap that up now. Um, I invite you to visit my website uh, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution slash Cone Lab uh, for more information on our work. Thank you so much. I look forward to any questions you have. Thank you, Anne. Um, and while we're getting Warren to 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 set up his slide, uh, I just wanted we may lose Anne in the next 15 minutes. Um, uh, are there any questions that uh, uh, someone wants to ask now? You can put it into the chat or try and raise your hand, and and Neville will see if we can allow you to speak with the setup in MS Teams. Now, for any questions for Anne right now, we'll take them. Yes. I think you have the power to unmute yourself if you want to. And while, while Warren is waiting, I have a question yeah. for you, and that is um, South African corals, you said there's 125 kilometers of them. They um, special in any way? I mean, does it continue to Mozambique, one assumes, uh, those coral reefs? Anything special or particularly vulnerable about South African corals? So just to put it in perspective, uh, the South African reefs are just the southern end of the entire East African reef system, which is incredibly valuable um, economically and ecologically to the world. Um, you guys have the, the southernmost reef systems in the world. They're actually still relatively pristine, which is amazing. I think the, the world is starting to discover the dive opportunities in Southern Africa. I believe there were about 70,000 divers um, to, to just the, the Southern African reefs, maybe even just Sudwana Bay in the last yeah. few years per year. Is that correct? Um, so just incredible opportunity there with respect to the with respect to reef tourism the ecological importance of those reefs because they are uh, the southernmost reefs in the world 
um, really deserve a lot of attention. To be honest, um, we haven't expanded our ocean acidification work into Southern Africa at this point, um, but, so, but the Southern African reefs will, cert it will certainly be part of our uh, global campaign as we move forward. Um, and you'll probably be hearing from us soon because um, setting up partnerships um, in this arena has been absolutely critical to our work in other places in the world. Thank you. That's Thank a you. good segue for Warren. I see there's another question. Janet Solomon has her hand up. Janet? Thank you very much for this presentation. It's been most informative. Um, we have a, um, a, a growing threat with regard to um, a government drive for offshore oil and gas with 26 potential new wells being explored probably in the next two years along this coastline. Um, I, I'm battling to find any correlation between um, the actual effects of, of oil and gas um, exploration on, on uh, reef life and coral development per se. Would you have any comment with regard to this? Um, hi, Janet. That's a great question. I'm really sad um, to hear. Um, I guess progress <laughs> has to go on, right? And, and we just have to defend the natural world as best we can. Um, I, it's not my oil and gas exploration intersecting with coral reef ecosystems is not my expertise. My guess is that the location of oil wells um, or gas wells is probably not on the coral reefs themselves, and it's probably are probably located further offshore. Am I correct? Because the coral yes, reefs are, yes, really, you are. Are, are close inshore. Yes, you are. Yeah, um, yeah. It depends. So my on sense where... is that probably the bigger threats are coming from um, the adjacent land and land use, uh, and from climate change, from ocean acidification and warming. Um, so. But, but you know what, I'm going to connect you. If you, if you email me at acoan at, at hui.edu, I will connect you with the Coral List server if you're not already connected. Um, and there's a ton of expertise that you can tap into there uh, with respect to the specific question you have related to oil and gas wells, because there will be people on that list server who have, it, who have direct experience with this. Um, so if you'd like me to do okay. that, I can certainly connect you. I'll, I'll put those emails in the follow-up email. Uh, um, uh, Ashley, I think there's another question. David, do you mind holding until Warren has spoken? I, I don't want to run out of time. Yes, we, uh, we want to wrap up around six. Thanks, thanks, Anne. Okay, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, and uh, Neville and I, or we can discuss the questions and we can email them to you if, if we have to lose you. I know you have to run off in a few minutes. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to our last speaker. Dr. Warren Gilbert, and his expertise is in ocean and atmosphere biogeochemistry, specializing in ocean carbon cycling, and a particular focus on carbon dioxide interaction in the ocean atmosphere interface. Warren completed his PhD in 2014 um, at UCT, University of Cape Town, investigating surface primary productivity in the Atlantic Southern Ocean, and he used a range of in situ observation techniques uh, Amongst others, these included uh, isotopically labeled nitrogen trace experiments with uptake of nitrogen by phytoplankton, and he also used an underway equilibrator inlet mass spectrometry. Warren, you can correct those, that pronunciation when you start speaking. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Warren has led and participated in numerous research campaigns in the Southern Ocean and around the South African coastline, deploying and, deploying and retrieving a range of scientific instruments. He is currently the lead scientist of the South African Global Atmosphere Watch Lab managed by the South African Weather Service. Thank you, Warren. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ashley, and everybody else that has already um, spoken. So my brief um, was basically to give a South African perspective on ocean acidification and um, I want, I want to keep it at that. This is a perspective. This is not the South African perspective. So 
what I tried to do was basically just collate um, a couple of uh, the work that is being done currently in South Africa around ocean acidification, uh, particularly just to, to highlight some of the progress that we are making um, and activities that's currently happening. Um, I've also um, borrowed quite generously from a lot of the colleagues that are online um, and a lot have sent me some slides to include here. And um, so I just want to acknowledge up front already that this is not necessarily uh, my own work, but um, a collection of some of the activities that's already happening um, in South Africa. So um, I don't know if my slide has moved there. Can somebody confirm that it is on the yes. South African yes. context? Thanks very yeah. much. OK, so um, just to um, I'm sure everybody or a lot of people um, that's on the call already is familiar with this uh, with this image, basically that that shows South Africa being wedged between these two uh, boundary currents, the cold Benguela on the west coast, which is basically um, a nutrient rich um, upwelling area that's a lot colder, highly productive. We have a lot of harmful algal bloom activity happening on our west coast. Um, that's already being um, investigated. And along with the upwelling activity that's happening, there's a lot of interest from that deep, uh, rich, uh, or deep nutrient rich, high CO2 waters that could potentially come up onto the shelf on the West Coast. Similarly, on our East Coast, we, or not similarly, but dissimilarly on our East Coast, we have the warmer Gullis current, which is highly energetic, um, and uh, the surface waters, I mean, there's a gradient of eight to 10 degrees, uh, maybe that's much, eight degrees between the two, um, uh, the two coasts. And this basically provides quite a unique and interesting environment for uh, us as researchers to basically consider the uh, activities associated uh, with uh, the carbon cycle, um, that's happening around our coastline. Um, I wanted to briefly just highlight, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this already, but uh, highlight some of the capabilities um, infrastructure wise that South, South Africa already have has. We have um, several research vessels that's uh, patrolling around our coastline and on which uh, we do a lot of research at the coast, as well as our Antarctic vessel. I don't know, maybe I should have a pointer. An Arctic research vessel, vessel that services our um, Antarctic uh, research program. We have, um, to some extent, some state-of-the-art laboratories that can um, develop uh, high uh, sensor technologies that can monitor uh, um, carbonate parameters, pH, uh, DIC alkalinity. Um, we have uh, um, we have uh, surface buoys that are tethered to the bottom um, that are scattered around our coastline that we can utilize basically to to monitor some of the the activities. So, what I'm going to try and do uh, is basically just highlight some of the current activities, and I already mentioned that that's happening along our west coast and our east coast, and the activity that's within um, within the Southern Ocean. So along our west coast, um, ocean uh, or the CO2 dynamics um, and ocean certification is being monitored at the moment continuously by our um, National Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. Uh, basically what's happening is on a quarterly basis, uh, the research vessel goes out along our west coast and basically traverse the, those uh, monitoring lines that um, that I've shown on the on the screen there, and does both surface as well as water column profiles of um, you know all of the um, hydrographic parameters, um, but also recently, and I say recently, um, uh, sort of in inverted commas, um, recently we've also included um, a partial pressure of CO two measurements. The dissolved inorganic carbon measurements and total alkalinity measurements um, along these transects. Um, the idea basically is to, for us to 
better understand the spatial and temporal changes of the sources and sinks along our west coast and to sort of understand the context of um, the upwelling system uh, from a global in a in a global context particularly related to uh, issues associate, associated uh, with um, ocean acidification. This work is primarily being led by Mtutu um, Tsanwani um, at the at our government department. And um, so some of the results or the, the data that's basically coming out of um, um, these monitoring lines is what you can see on the left there basically is uh, all of the panels that uh, indicate the surface PCO2 starting in February 2015. Uh, the, the program is running on a quarterly basis. Um, so on every quarter, uh, the ship basically goes out and monitors not only what's happening in the surface from a PCO2 perspective, but also what's happening um, in the sub subsurface by looking at the dissolved inorganic carbon and um, alkalinity parameters. What you can see on the right hand side there, um, and Mtutu and I have been discussing this, uh, is basically our the, the PCO2 uh, just uh, uh, expressed uh, in a, uh, spatially. So it shows the variability basically of the PCO2 in the top panel, where um, the southern part of the of the of the transect um, is much less variable. However, there are instances of extremely high PCO2 values that uh, has been observed along these transects. Now, part of the reason why the, um, this data has not necessarily been been published yet and the ambition of uh, is for us to actually make it part of our contribution basically to the global uh, database, the SOCAT database for uh, for these PCO2 measurements. However, we still need to put it through, through a, a peer review, review process uh, just so that our colleagues can actually um, also affirm uh, that what we are actually observing in um, in the Benguela is actually real. I mean, there's values of PCO2 that are up to uh, a thousand uh, microatmospheres which to some extent could be unrealistic, and I would like to actually pick um, Richard's brain to hear if that sort of values are realistic, and if it's also uh, observed uh, on the west coast of, of the US. Um, some early work um, that was uh, presented uh, a while back basically looked at um, the St. Helena Bay region uh, in terms of addressing the question that was uh, asked, posed at the time globally on whether or not upwelling systems are actually net contributors of CO2 to the atmosphere, or whether they are um, actually sinks of CO2 to the atmosphere. And um, Luke, uh, Gregor, and Pedro published a paper um, in, I think it's 2012, 2013, about uh, showing that actually that the Benguela is actually a, a, a small sink of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, I'm sure that that question is continuously being addressed and uh, basically what they did was look at surface uh, CO2 concentrations as well as subsurface DIC and alkalinity um, measurements to calculate the actual PCO2 in the, in the surface waters to measure the actual extent of the flux between the atmosphere and the ocean um, in that region. Um, so progressing from that, um, still in St. Helena Bay, Bay, uh, Bay, sorry, still in St. Helena Bay, there is currently the long-term monitoring mooring, um, also managed by Grant Pitcher and the team at uh, DFFE that has started measurements, continuous measurements of partial pressure of CO2, as well as, um, as pH uh, in situ. Um, and that's happening at several depths within the water column. So dissolved inorganic carbon and, and alkalinity is being measured uh, both to calibrate the sensors, but also to have a continuous record of DIC of the carbonate system within um, within St. Helena Bay at that mooring station that is there. The station has existed um, 
for a very long time, but only in 2016 has um, CO uh, carbonate measurements also started to be included um, in the suite of observations that are happening there. Um, I want to jump now to the the east coast um, of South Africa, where um, the, the 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 east coast particularly is 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 quite. Um, there's quite extensive corals uh, being observed in on the on the east coast of South Africa, and, and um, the team at the Oceanographic Research Institute, um, led by um, Dave uh, Pearton and and Sean uh, Porter, has basically established a laboratory where they are doing continuous uh, baseline monitoring um, of the carbonate parameters, but also set up a a, a very nice uh, laboratory for actually assessing the impacts that um, that changes in the uh, carbonate system, the pH basically, in um, in the waters that are that are along the coast. They are actually having on the corals, and they're looking at um, coral accretion and dissolution rates um, along with the with the with the carbonate chemistry. And then also um, subjecting the corals to to changes not only in the temperature but also um, in the pH in the at the laboratories that they have there. So and I'm sure they will be able to to comment because they're also participating um, in the call today. Um, then moving a little bit further south, um, also still in the uh, Agalis, there's uh, the shallow marine and coastal research infrastructure that is basically um, hosted by N Nelson Mandela University, but um, driven uh, by Sayon. I might have that uh, semantics wrong. Um, and basically, the, 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 um, they've established several long-term um, environmental research stations that are basically sentinel sites um, in terms of looking at high resolution observations, um, including so, um, sensors to characterize not only the eco ecology, but also the biogeochemistry associated with, um, with the environments. And to that end, they've, they've got a mooring deployed um, at, at the, the uh, station in Algoa Bay, which includes uh, looking at currents or, and a weather station and includes uh, observations of partial pressure and uh, P, uh, pH um, at those stations. Further examples um, that, I've, that I also want to highlight are some sort of estuarine activities because estuarine um, estuaries are important nursing habitats for, for, for spawning of, of, of fish. And there's uh, recently some activities that are also that are also being highlighted, looking at particularly what the impacts are of uh, changes in pH on the um, environment, on the larval composition, for instance, within est estuaries. I also have the um, example there of Carla's uh, PhD that she re PhD that she recently um, completed, that also talks about the behavioral behavioral response of coastal fishes um, in Algoa Bay, and I'm sure she's also she was also utilizing some of the infrastructure um, that was set up um, at that Sentinel site in Algoa Bay. Um, some results that, well, uh, to just highlight, and I'm sure she can comment um, a lot on that, is basically what they've done is exposed um, a species there to a range of, of pH within the bay and monit monitored the um, the behavioral response of of um, of fish in 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 uh, Algoa Bay, and what they've observed was not necessarily changes in the in the uh, metabolic rates of 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 the fish, but the the mobility or the activity um, of the fishes are actually starting um, to be impacted by the different uh, ranges of pH that's being um, uh, being observed. Moving to the Southern Ocean, um, 
there was quite um, there is quite an extensive program um, of surface observation, particularly that's basically South Africa's contribution to the surface ocean uh, carbon atlas. Um, not only looking at just continuous underway measurements of CO of surface CO two um, on board uh, the SA Agala, so the research ships, but also looking um, at the at deploying autonomous uh, sort of platforms to monitor the pH um, and 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 other carbonate parameters at um, um, autonomously, basically by using these remote. Um, uh, vehicles basically to 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 monitor and that's basically South Africa's contribution to the global atlas for for um, carbon observations and in a sense it the ambition is basically to ensure that you reduce because the southern ocean is so undersampled is to try and ensure that we reduce the uncertainties uh, in on the undersampled regions specifically to uh, the observations of fluxes of CO2 that we see uh, within the atmosphere. I thought to add the slide just to highlight also some of the activities associated with um, in from our regional partners on our East Coast. We have the um, Wyomsa program that was also mentioned by, by Sam earlier, which is basically uh, participation uh, between all of the countries sharing the coast um, or the ocean on the left, and have recently also started acknowledging or including ocean acidification or the parameters that are uh, important for monitoring ocean acidification in in the ambitions of that program or in both programs, not only uh, the Wyomsa on the on the east coast, but also the Benguela Current Convention on the on the west coast. Um, <clears throat> I am not an authority on this, but I basically let me just quickly mention also some of the work that's being done on some economically important species. Um, again, looking at physiological responses of the acid base chemistry and how it's basically affecting the rock lobster uh, hemolymph uh, properties is basically the blood properties associated or blood properties associated with rock lobsters and how it's being affected by various ranges of um, uh, pH that's that these in, these uh, organisms are exposed to. Similar to other to the abalone uh, farming industry has also realized that it's important and has also um, started to invest or try and see if it's not possible to invest in understanding what it is or how will the abalone um, shells basically respond to um, to various change to, to changes that we are starting to observe in um, in the pH. So in a nutshell, that's definitely not necessarily an extensive list, but it basically just highlights some of the activities that are currently already happening um, from an ocean acidification perspective within South Africa. I'm sure I've left out a lot of activities that are being considered, but um, I'm sure we can have a discussion about those later. Um, some general comments. We have been making progress, um, although in some to some instances, uh, some of that progress is 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 being is happening very slowly. Technologies are starting to advance very fast, and you know the advent of sort of low cost sensors, etc., are starting to really open up opportunities to to deploy these a lot more, and we can. At the moment, at least, start us answering questions associated with the dynamics um, um, and potential future implications of and ecological impacts uh, that can potentially happen along um, our coast, our coastline. The scope of OA is quite broad. You know, it's highly technical on the one end, um, and on the other end, um, as Sam showed, one can do um, really interesting experiments with not necessarily um, an expensive setup. You know, you can set up a, a, an OA experiment within a within a two weeks type of thing and, and start answering questions associated with that. And my advice, and I think at least for us in South Africa, is that we should actually have the ambition to do both of those. You know, we should try and see if we can 
um, uh, enhance our, you know, the the technical, the highly technical uh, area associated with ocean acidification research, research, but also ensure that we 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 do the seemingly um, simple experiments, uh, but that could still make a contribution to our understanding because a lot of the understanding is still very uh, very basic in a sense. Um, from a resources perspective, I think, um, and this is just a general comment, I think in South Africa, and but globally probably, the resources for doing this is probably very, there's very few people that is starting to be addressed. And I mean, one can just look at the uh, PhD uh, programs that's starting to come up and, you know, a lot of students are starting to do projects on ocean certification because um, they found it important. And finally, I think in South Africa, we do need a, a concerted effort, um, probably sort of a state of ocean acidification research uh, where the community can get together and say, this is currently what we have um, and where we are to probably properly assess um, um, and guide what direction we should take going forward. So I close with those with those sort of general um, remarks and say thanks. Back to you, Neville and Ashley. Thanks, eh? Thanks, Warren. Thanks, Warren. Uh, and you uh, slightly saved us uh, with some time, two some minutes. Time. So ah, time. Excellent. Um, um, but, uh, but we have, we are have running, we are running late, and, late and as usual, we squeeze for time for discussion. Time. Sam, um, you want to add something? I see there's, oh, I'm not sure if your hand was up. But you may want to just reiterate the comment you typed in while um, I'll just around Neville to look at the discussion to see if he picked up on any other things. I think there was someone who wanted to speak after Anne spoke. I'm not sure if we were able to answer it without Anne, but at least all of us can can hear the question. So Sam, do you want to add to your comment to put into the chat? Uh, uh, I tried to answer in the chat. Something I wanted to mention before that is actually the the Ocean Acidification Africa network. So I, I mentioned like the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, and, and the community is really well organized around ocean acidification research and monitoring. And, and you have also the OA Africa network that is really great. Uh, actually, Warren was the, the co-lead for, for a little while. And uh, actually, I invite you all, you starting in the field to actually uh, join and be part of this. There's a lot of really great opportunities and initiative. So I think it's uh, it's worth having a, a look at that, uh, even if you're experienced. That's also very useful. So in the Actually, chat, you know, we were just discussing about about uh, trainings basically, and uh, there was a great idea of having some trainings focusing more on some specific solution like ecosystem restoration and blue carbon. And I think that's a good idea. So I think I will be in touch regarding this and see if we can have uh, joint forces with the blue carbon community and, and see if we could actually have more specific workshops organized towards solutions. So thank you for the comment. I think it was Jenny who made this, this suggestion. Ashley, um, Dave Pearson did have a question, but he did comment and send a message to Anne and I'll make sure she gets it because she had to leave the call. So Dave might still want to say something. Uh, and I have a question which I'd like to direct at Richard, if that's OK. That's fine. Uh, let's give Dave first uh, a chance if he wants to add something to his comment. Dave, still are you still here? I'm not sure if Dave is still here. Maybe he's left. So, uh, no, no, sorry. Oh, you are. Um, Good. <laughs> no, it's, I, I just wanted to highlight the coral reef. Um, and the Wyomsa, um program that um, Sam alluded to. Um, so there is active work going on in South Africa recently. And yes, we actively um, encourage collaboration from everywhere because, as you say, we're a small country and um, we lack some of the capabilities from, from other areas. So, yes, uh, global cooperation and Sam has been remarkably um helpful in this regard he came out to do trainings and yeah so we science a global enterprise and we certainly welcome as much um, and within south africa as well we, we do have an active community working on this thanks warren for your your input that's all i wanted to say thank you
Thanks, Dave. Uh, Neville? Um, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll make some concluding comments later. But um, uh, Richard, one thing which I, I don't think I got was what what the acidifying oceans mean for uh, the the ability of the oceans in the future to continue uh, absorbing carbon dioxide. In other words, what are the feedbacks of the changing pH to the carbon balance in general? You did mention it accelerating. You showed some of those data, but I'm interested to know, you know, whether the acidifying process changes the overall chemistry, which affects the ability of the of the ocean to absorb carbon dioxide. Thanks. Uh, now, well, that's a wonderful question, and you go have to go back into the thermodynamics of the chemistry of seawater to provide an answer to that. And X actually has been addressed in a lot of recent papers. And the idea is that as you add more and more CO2 into the oceans, you change the buffer capacity of seawater. Sea and you actually are lowering that buffer capacity. That is the ability of the ocean to take up more carbon dioxide in the future. And the net result is that um, actually the pH changes faster but carbonate ion concentration changes slower. And this is because you're getting down to their limiting concentration for carbonate ion concentration, but the pH is continue to decrease more rapidly. We actually see that in some of the data already. So at high latitude regions, for example, you saw from the maps that I showed that the pH is is a decrease is more rapid at high latitude. That's the changing buffer capacity with the, with the the changing temperature conditions as an example of that. But if I had the same kind of map for for uh, ragonite saturation, you would see the opposite occurring. So so we must expect, and we do model these changes. Uh, because the buffer capacity, fortunately, is known quite well. Thanks, Richard. Um, Thanks. There is another question. Um, yep. The person's name is, I will tell you once I get there, Nuet Gordon. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Nemo. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers. It was very interesting. So I'm sitting in the Seychelles. Um, so obviously, you know, we are island state, ocean acidification is definitely high on the priority list for the researchers, not so much for the people that have the money. So my question mainly to Sam, I think, is for us to do some research and set up a, a laboratory specific for ocean acidification, what are the minimum requirements to make it comparable so that the results that we get can be fed into these larger models and monitoring systems? That, that's a really good question. So basically, if you want to do your chemistry right in terms of monitoring of the chemistry, that can be quite challenging because for that, you need high quality measurements and, and that's probably the harder uh, Part. I think if you want to do so, so that 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 would be like then then you can talk with with Richard. Actually, who would tell you more about that. But basically, the 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 high level quality measurements that you need for the chemical monitoring can, can be quite quite high and challenging. But what you can easily do is is biology. I think biology can be a good first step because for that you need lower quality measurements. So you need to document properly the carbonate chemistry in your experiment, but you don't need to reach the same level that you would require for, for monitoring in the field. So for that, basically what you need is a good pH meter, like a glass electrode that you calibrate properly. So for that, now you have possibilities of buying or, or making your own trace buffer if you have a good chemistry lab. So you need to measure pH properly. You need to measure another parameter of the carbonate system. That can be done at, done at low cost by titration, for example. So again, you, you need a decent chemical uh, laboratory around where you can do these measurements. And then when it comes to the biology, as I said in my presentation, just seawater, a little bit of, of equipment and a little bit of creativity, and you can make very decent research. But you need a minimum of chemistry, that's for sure. You need to be able to characterize the carbonate system. So that's the best practice. You have a lot of really cool best practice guides. and. I know there is also like a an online training that's going to be available soon for the Global Ocean Teacher Academy, where you can actually have all the information you need about how to start 
But if you want more information, I can also forward best practices and stuff like that. But that, that would be my answer. You, you, if you start with biology, it's easier. You need like basically a decent uh, chemical laboratory. And if you want to do more like uh, monitoring, then you need to have more fancy equipment. There's also the, there is a box that is available, like it's called Goan in a box, where you have all the equipment you need and, and, and you can be selected if you're lucky to get one of these boxes to, to have the minimum requirement for the chemistry. Is it answering your question? Yes, great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add that I would recommend highly that you join the Global Ocean Acidification Network. And in that process, if you do develop a monitoring program, they will help you with that as well as get your data submitted to the uh, network itself. The, the network group uh, that works uh, helps you evaluate your data and you can compare your data against uh, everyone else's. So that really is a benefit to you to see how well you're doing. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Richard. We'll do that. Thank you to all of you. I think it's six o'clock or one minute past six in South Africa. Uh, anyway, um, and um, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I, I, I was supposed to add some, to say something intelligent, but all of you have used up the time, so that takes the pressure off me. <laughs> thing to say from, um, from um, people want government to say something about what we will do now on this. And for me, the take home message thing is three things. One, it's not an either or adapt adaptation or mitigation on these things. And two, uh, the cat is there. We need to kill the cat. But we need to show some relevance to people who are using coastal ecosystems to show this is an important um, uh, theme that they need to get involved in. And three, what struck me from the people who registered and from the participants in South Africa at least, and at least in Seychelles, it sounds like there's a younger group of people involved in ocean acidification. Um, and by that I mean sort of 40 ish and below. So one is included. So I think there's a lot of energy around the, around the topic. And we, we're looking for, for, for some young champions to bring this uh, because it, it does require some technology and good science um, and to show, well, there's the energy there and we will try and support it as a government research organization where we can. Warren is in, in, in weather services. Uh, he showed you Muchuchu's work and we also have Tato joined our chemistry group now. So get in contact and uh, don't be afraid to make the proposals because we have uh, Neville and Sam and Richard and myself who can assist as well. And that goes to our other people who've joined us as well in the region, the island states around Africa or the Southern Hemisphere. We're happy to 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 play a coordinating role on this topic. Thanks and that's back to you now Neville. Thank you all very, very much for attending. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. I do feel the need to follow this up. I want to take Warren's idea forward about a sort of state of the nation address. Clearly, there's a lot going on. Maybe we need another level of organization, and that's something which we'll pursue. But to our guests and to Ashley, I really can't thank you enough for, for your time and your contribution today. Okay, so we'll leave it there, and I will send you all the video link when it's up and running. Thanks again.